Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and I'm so glad you're with us to stay curious on the moon. Of course, here we are today on the moon as NASA announced that they were going to let Blue Origin be a lunar partner on the Artemis mission and build the lander for the third lunar landing. And we'll talk a little bit about that today, as today is Future Fridays. We put the image up there. If we have some problems, we may go off air again and come right back, as we've got some, we don't know what's going on, but we've got some uh, CPU outputs that spike, and create. then we can't change our pictures here. But, uh, and Marty says, don't touch any keys because it's messing up again, but uh, we may touch them anyway to see. Yeah, I, I, I already tried it. Okay. Okay. Well, Marty Winkle, my co-producer, we're on episode 815, and and uh, it's unusual that we're having such bad problems, but we're so grateful that you stick up with us here as we're going through there. So that might be Trekkie Techie on his phone. Okay. Uh, so we can't advance anything right now, Marty, as we're kicking off a show that we're going to talk about some of the lunar startup companies that you've never heard about. Certainly some of them I didn't hear about doing my book report for Stay Curious today. But we're also going to look uh, at uh, what was said about the Blue Origin and other partners involved, including Northrop Grumman, that are going to build a lander parallel to the Starship that SpaceX is pioneering to land on the moon. So just like Apollo going to the moon 54 years ago with Apollo 10, and Snoopy, the lunar module, LM number four. This is a fluid situation with going back to the moon. As 50 is half a century ago, we did not have things ironed out exactly the way they were going to be. And some things changed along the way, including concepts of the Grumman lunar module as they kept making it lighter and lighter and lighter. So, uh, so it racked up some interesting visuals and we're also going to talk about two shuttles that were launched today in space history uh, on the same date sts 77 and sts 101 uh, and they landed on the same day uh, may 29th uh, so uh, some notable crew members there and photographs from the usiac brothers our partners tom and mark usiac uh have uh, allowed us to use their photography from covering 70 space shuttle launches uh, throughout their careers there. So should we try it, Marty? It's not going to go because I've already tried to advance and I tried to go to four. Uh -huh. so it's just running at 33% and it'll, it may not crash, but it's just not going to change. Okay. Well, <laughs> Let's look at what, uh, also we've got a launch Sunday we're going to, uh, 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 Sunday at 5.37 p.m., uh, Axiom mission number two, led by Peggy Whitson, NASA's most experienced astronaut. She is now the head uh, chief astronaut for Axiom, and three rookies are going to go to space with her uh, on Sunday evening so that will be a big deal just a few blocks from here at space view park as the rocket on pad 39a is 10 miles from where marty and i are sitting patiently wanting our program here to reach uh do you think you uh, so i'll let marty give me the go here when we think we should go but if we crash we'll make an effort to come back again you see the image go large and we're good we should be good. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. I see. He made this, this, uh, what you're seeing here, uh, enlarged it. And that's what's happening is we can't manipulate anything on our Streamlabs photography slideshow. All right. I can talk uh, and talk, talk, talk. Here's my slideshow, Marty. Zoom in like the old days there. Okay. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, he went for the camera there. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that today, but that's how we did it uh, two years ago was zooming in on the uh, photographs that we printed out. Uh, we had a partner of ours allow us to use a printer so our nonprofit didn't get a lot of expense for the ink, which I'm always cognizant 
of uh, saving money here at our nonprofit. So we have to wait for the moon startups to go big. So let's look at what um, was said today at the Artemis conference, uh, press conference this morning with Bill Nelson, our NASA director. Uh, he said uh, uh, that Blue Origin has been selected to develop a landing system for the Artemis V mission to the moon uncovering scientific discoveries and preparing uh, for future missions to Mars. All right. Blue Origin will design, develop, test, and verify its Blue Moon Lander to meet NASA's human landing requirements for reoccurring astronaut expeditions to the lunar surface, including docking at the Gateway. And Blue Moon was the concept that Northrop Grumman, Blue Origin, five other companies got shot down for the starship that is shown here uh, uh, and the Blue Moon, uh, new concept of the Blue Moon is over on the left there. Uh, quite smaller, uh, but about a lot larger than the 23 foot tall lunar module that was headed to the moon today. So let's see what we can do here to help you stay curious. Go HistoryTravel.org. Thank you, friends, for your support. They are a great little website there. I just saw it flash once, Marty, uh, with all kinds of historical stops that you've never even heard of. So go check out GoHistoryTravel.org. And thank you, Carlton Bailey, for this rocket launch photo about, I think it was 2.30 in the morning. Originally going to go about 12.30. I got up for it. They moved it back and then went to bed. They moved it back again. Uh, but this is a, a shot from about 30 miles away. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is what the locals get. And then, of course, those noisy rockets waking us up in the middle of the night. But uh, good luck uh, to SpaceX, and uh, they certainly have changed everything here on the Space Coast. Well, we've got a birthday, and we want to wish a happy birthday to former NASA astronaut who is 68 years old, Pierre Thouet. Thouet considers Fairfax, Virginia, in New Bedford, Massachusetts, to be his hometown, though he was born in Groton, Connecticut. 68 years old today, spent 27 days in space on three space shuttle flights, took part in the historic three-man spacewalk of Endeavor in May 1992, uh, STS-49, one of our shuttles of the month of May. And he's got 15 hours of EVA, a Navy captain, Thoet, played a uh, Martin backpacker is what he has in his hands there, about a $300 little beautifully tuned guitar that uh, I saw up in Appalachia a lot as people out walking the Appalachian Trail, and I'm up there in Damascus, Virginia, stargazing a lot, had those. So, though it was nicknamed Pepe for his French-sounding name, he's also called a 24-volt person in a 12-volt world due to his hyperactivity and constant nervous repartee prior to launch, and I don't blame you. Peter, uh, Pierre, I would be nervous too. But he did three beautiful space flights, uh, 42, 52, and uh, 36, all right? Uh, so, uh, no, for, 49, I got, that's wrong, 40. So uh, good luck to him. Uh, and uh, hope that uh, he's enjoying his retirement and hope that you come out to the Space Center and share some time with us groupies out there. Well, Marty, uh, we look uh, back to the future and going to the moon, as we talked about today with NASA, they definitely stand on the giants of the Apollo astronauts. And here is the, uh, the Apollo shield uh, for the crew mission that the call sign was Charlie Brown and Snoopy. We've talked about that, that Ch Charles Schultz of Peanuts comic strip fame wholly endorsed. The dominant design elements are the spacecraft that circles the moon as a lunar module as ascent stage flies up from its low pass over the lunar surface with its engines firing, which, Marty, we know you would never see the flame on those engines in the vacuum of space. <clears throat> Earth is in the background. Uh, the mission number of the flight represented is a large Roman numeral in the center of design, as was the Apollo and Gemini flights were known by Roman numerals, not the Arabic numbers. Uh, but the X also marks X is the spot, that this was going to be a flight that marked out the X that we're going to see in a minute. 
where that X was that they photographed for the July landing of Apollo 11. The crew designed the patch. Uh, primarily, Gene Cernan and John Young had their hands in it. And the artwork was created by Alan Stevens of North American Aviation. Thought you'd like to know some of the history behind that. So, um, And we've got the... Um, uh, okay, yeah, that, I didn't... Uh, we were talking about the launch. Uh, there is the lunar module that we have on display here. I was looking for the Axiom crew picture. And uh, that must not have come through, Marty. So thank you for efforting to put that in there. I must have had the wrong format. But we are the moon landing of 54 years ago in July was preceded by the uh, 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 full dress rehearsal except the landing. This was the 1962 concept that we have in our museum, a priceless artifact out of the Grumman archives. And uh, there was the... Lunar module number four, named Snoopy, uh, Snoopy uh, orbiting the moon as it left uh, the command module and John Young behind. And this is the site of the Mare Tranquility area where the uh, Apollo 11 landed. You've got this crater on the bottom. It's called Molt Key. You can see that in my backyard telescope. And then about the after that first ridge of lava flows, somewhere in there is where they landed. Uh, uh, the eagle, Lem 5 of Grumman's. And we have some beautiful artwork. Thank you, Chris Kelly, one of the world-renowned space artists and friends of our museum. He did these montages uh, specifically to take two Apollo gatherings of astronauts uh, to show them there. But there's a Saturn V rocket liftoff. Uh, and these montages are photographs. They're uh, some of it's computerized stuff, and then some of it is globs of, of uh, paint that I know Chris loves throwing artistically on his montages. And here's the other montage he did for Apollo 10. And you can uh, find out how to own these yourself at CaliSpaceArt.com, C-A-L-L-E, SpaceArt.com. And uh, Chris is up in uh, Connecticut and enjoying the springtime weekend there, Chris. So thank you for your support of the American Space Museum and sharing with us these gorgeous montages that uh, you created of the Apollo era. And uh, then he did the shuttle, and now, now uh, he's even got a gorgeous Artemis montage that we've shared with you. So the shuttles of May, 10 beautiful shuttles of May, 75 astronauts can say I was orbiting the Earth in the month of May. And we're going to zero in on STS-77 and STS-101 right there, launched four years apart on the exact same day. And we love putting together juxtaposing space history. And I don't expect you to really digest this, except look about in the middle. And we have got six shuttles orbiting the Earth during the month of, um, I mean, during on uh, uh, the uh, 19th of uh, May, you've got 125, which is the yellow. The green is 132, 84, 134, 77, and 101 are all orbiting the Earth on this date in history. And they'll be orbiting it until 125 comes back on uh, the 25th. So we actually have almost a whole week like six days where six orbiters will be orbiting the Earth in space history. And uh, among those, six times uh, over 30 astronauts involved in that. They can say, this week, I was up in space, guys. Aren't you impressed? So uh, 11 people can say they were orbiting the Earth uh, on this date. And there is the, uh, the traditional arrival at the Cape. I think uh, uh, one of the UCAC brothers took that photograph. In there, uh, they arrive in the T-38s. Uh, six were on STS-77 in 1996 aboard Endeavour, and uh, then Atlantis. Uh, here is that crew. Uh, Space Lab Hab Four was a science mission focused on biotechnology, electronic uh, materials, and agriculture, and they also uh, sent out into space this this uh, experiment. Uh, there's the launch, a beautiful. Panorama launch by Mark Usiak there. And there is the remote camera set up. 
and they are Star Trek fans, obviously, this crew here, uh, and uh, posed uh, with their commander, uh, 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 John Casper. Yeah, John Casper's there in the middle, uh, and you've got um, Daniel Borsch, Mario Runco Jr., Mark Garno, and Andy Thomas. And uh, uh, Andy Thomas isn't in that picture. Uh I don't think Kurt Brown is either. So a lot of spoofs there to ease the pressure when they do uh, photo shoots there at Johnson Space Center. This was part of the experiment, a uh, collapsible space foil system to gauge different ways of transportation. And then you had a night launch of SCS-101, a hard hat construction mission. Uh, that is one of the, the, uh, the amazing pictures of the shuttle three-decade era of the launches. Uh, they put smoke detectors up there. There's the whole crew up there, big crew. Uh, they were led by Commander James Hulsell, Pilot Scott Horowitz, Jeffrey Williams, James Voss, Susan Helms, and Yuri Yusevich are uh, in there. And the, this was the first time that they flew Atlantis with a glass cockpit that you see there, beautiful uh, difference from all the toggle switches in there and on the spacewalk one of the James Voss handled this gigantic bolt and nut in space and it looks like it I don't know exactly what it is but I love that picture and didn't pardon me take the time to look at what he was maneuvering in there but it's part of the International Space Station construction that was going on uh, uh, in uh, on this date in the year 2000 at the very infancy of our beautiful space station that's been occupied for over 22 years well moon startups all right let's talk about the moon startups and um celebrating the 21st century on future fridays here on stay curious we want to try to stick to that because uh, there's so much future to look at as we're talking about today the uh, nasa said that the uh, Artemis program was going to include this spacecraft to be built by Blue Origin, which they've been building anyway. We had a Blue Origin worker in here today, Marty, that told me that when they did, were declined the uh, contract two years ago, they kept building it anyway because they're going to go to the moon with or without NASA, is Jeff Bezos. You better believe it. They sniff out more money and the potential to have you know, the most unique uh, honeymoon or uh, holiday experience ever. And uh, I don't think it'll happen in my lifetime that's ahead of me here, but I know it's going to come some point in human history. Well, the agency previously contracted SpaceX to demonstrate an initial human landing system for the Artemis III mission. And that, of course, is the Starship uh, that has not uh, flown around Earth's orbit yet, but it will. Under that contract, the agency also directed SpaceX to evolve its design to meet the agency's requirements for sustainable exploration and to demonstrate uh, a lander for Artemis IV. Uh, well, as a result of the contract with Blue Origin to demonstrate Artemis V, a lander, uh, they will have dual capabilities. And uh, Lisa Watson Morgan, manager of the Human Landing System Program at Marshall Space Flight Center, in charge of all this, uh, Lisa Watson Morgan says, quote, having two distinct lunar landing designs will, with different approaches to how they meet NASA mission needs provides more robustness and ensures a regular cadence of moon landings. Well, it makes sense to me. After all, our military didn't rely on just one uh, a jet fighter okay they would have new ones and use all the old ones uh here thanks to everyday astronaut uh okay uh todd uh, tim dodd for putting this together to kind of put it all together in your mind's eye what are we talking about here well we're talking about the lunar uh lander limb on the far left there you know, 27 feet tall okay and that's what's going to the moon 54 years ago to barnstorm it nine miles and then come back Dianetics is a company that has built a lander like this uh, to take your payloads or experiments to the moon if you want. And the Blue Origin National Team that got rejected two years ago and now are back in 
uh, the, uh, as a backup or a, a, a alternate landing or that when it's available. This is their uh, uh, lander, okay. Uh, again, 30 feet tall, something like that. Um, not too much larger than the lunar lander LEM, but probably more spacious on there. The concept that they want to go to is a landing platform, and then you could have on it cargo that you don't need an ascent stage to go back, or you could have an ascent stage on it. But they got to get a lot of cargo on the moon if they're going to build these moon bases that they're talking about. And then there's the Starship, which, if that works, and I think it'll probably work, give it a couple, three years, um, it can take a lot of payload to the moon. And once that starts working, maybe the Blue Origin team will look at taking their their spacecraft to uh, uh, asteroids, uh, or they all want to go to Mars. So don't we all want to go to Mars, Marty? I don't think we'll ever see that in our lifetimes. But to give you an idea of the kind of money involved now in, uh, in space, um, $178 billion was invested in space economy in 2021. Okay, that, that's the whole decade. I'm sorry. The whole decade is $178 billion uh, from uh, 2011 to 2021. It is about $15 billion a year now, which is NASA's budget. NASA's budget is $21 billion. So we're almost up to NASA's budget for the infrastructure companies that are vying to take things and you to space and what kind of things we need in space a lot of things think of the the things we have on earth that we take for granted like the communications so we need to build communication systems on the moon we need to what feed people we need to have a lot of food a lot of water uh, a lot of protection from the harsh environment of the sun's uh, harmful x-rays that are not shielded at all so well, let's look at what's happened in this last week uh, around the moon. Two spacecraft have failed that are no bigger than the size of a refrigerator, okay? This is the Lunar Flashlight spacecraft sent to the moon last year to search for water deposits at the lunar south pole. Well, it won't be able to complete its mission as it, the probe had a propulsion problem. The briefcase, this is just a briefcase size spacecraft developed uh, uh, on tech, and it is a technological mission of will things work like this, so small. Uh, but uh, most of it worked until May 12th, and they lost contact with, they didn't lose contact with it, the uh, power control system, they think, uh, that was going to put it into orbit, has some debris in some of the, the, the systems in it that won't allow it to work right. So uh, Lunar Flashlight was launched December 11th, just 10 miles from Marty and I here on Cape Canaveral on top of a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket as a piggyback ride with this spacecraft called the Haku-R Lunar Lander of the Japanese Space Company. All right. So the one mission is lost, all right, just a suitcase size thing. They couldn't get it to do what they wanted it to do. And then this, about the size of a refrigerator, crash landed on the moon when they lost uh, uh, communications with it about uh, 200 feet above the surface. And it was traveling about 16 miles an hour, all right. And that was in April, uh, April 25th to be exact. So in the last three weeks, Two missions that were sent to the moon on the same Falcon 9 rocket uh, finally reached the moon, and the missions, uh, they're going to say a partial success because the technology that got them there that far is new. But these uh, these spacecraft, by the way, Marty knows building the helping build, the lunar module for Grumman, that just takes three days to go to the moon but not with these small spacecraft that didn't have a propulsion system to push them to the moon at 30,000 miles an hour. No, these were done in a kind of a, a corkscrew-like orbit that would expand out and get closer and closer to the moon until it's so far out that the moon literally runs into them, and then they use their thrusters to equalize it and go into orbit. That was the concept. Both of them didn't work. Okay, no confirmation that this landed safely, but there were no signals from the lander after touchdown, 
and they probably are putting the, our lunar reconnaissance orbiter on there because it can see things about a yard across on the moon, so it'd be able to see the splat where this happens. So, well, Marty, now for some companies you and I never heard of. Uh, you may have, I have never heard of intuitive machines. Their Latin motto is Atigo Planitia Luna. Uh, drive to the planes of the moon is what that's, that means, all right? And this is what they want to do. Uh, they want to create many things that we're going to need on the moon. One of them is a, a micro nova hopper. That's what this is about here, this patch. Can accommodate uh, about uh, three pounds of science payloads and, and go 25 kilometers from its initial landing footprint. So it can take a little over about three pounds of payload uh, to well within a 15 mile radius of where it lands on there. Uh, and the looking for critical science, uh, discovery places, other applications I'm sure we haven't even thought of. The other thing that they wanna do is develop a, this is Intuitive Machines, uh, putting uh, IA, uh, artificial intelligent robots, rovers on the moon. And one of the biggest plans is to, to create the uh, communications grid on the surface of the moon. If we're going to start putting people on there and private companies like Intuitive Machines are going to put a science experiment from Ohio State University on there, they need to be communicating more than just with one antenna at Goldstone or, or, or uh, in California or Canberra in Australia. They're going to have to create a whole new system up there. And this is part of it. The green is simulating the, the type of a communication system that would be invisible, of course, on the moon. They also, and go to Intuitive Machines. I guarantee you, you're going to see a lunar, um, they have a lunar access user's guide. That's 30 pages that you actually figure out what you want to do with something on the moon. And they will tell you how they, they're going to do it and where they can do it. And, and uh, then, of course, you get down to the uh, sharpening the pencils about how much is it going to cost for you to do it. By the way, the contract for uh, Blue Origin is about $3 billion for, to develop their lunar lander. And there's another uh, intuitive uh, 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 machines, an intuitive machine machine, Marty, uh, on the surface of the moon there. Uh, they could do all kinds of things. Some astronomers might want to put telescopes on the moon. They don't have to be optical. They could be radio telescopes. They could be gauging uh, solar uh, things uh, there in, in the void of the lunar surface. So, Well, another company, Green Onyx, all right. There's their logo. What does green make you think of? Well, vegetation, and that's certainly what they're about. They're in are an agro-tech startup that's developed its platform for cultivating and packaging crops. This is one of the many companies out of Israel. There must be four or five startup companies concerned about the moon out of Israel. This one out of Tel Aviv claims that its production efficiency is equivalent to a 3,000 square meter green vegetable field. I'm not sure how many acres that is, but... Um, but they're going to test their growing facilities on a platform in space soon. They want to grow water-based lentil plants uh, and make an autonomous, of course, artificial intelligent growing facility. So good luck to that while I have me a little drink. And so far, so good, huh, Marty? Yeah. So whatever the anomalies are, I've straightened out. And as soon as I say that, of course, we know what's going to happen. Well, here's a company called Exum, E-X-O-M. Think Space Serenity when you think Exum, okay? They are involved with sustainable habitats. Not only food will we have to consider for survival on the moon or Mars, but a suitable habitat. Uh, and, you know, let's face it, humans like to be comfortable, okay? So we're just not going to settle just for some little... Uh, shack up there on the moon or, uh, or or on Mars. We're going to want some creature comforts, and you know what? We're going to need them 
because of the psychological support platforms that are going to be needed to keep our brains from going crazy and not uh, wanting to uh, choke out the person across the, the tent from you, so to speak. But uh, they're collecting weather data. They're collecting psychological support data. They plan to develop a recognition system to analyze uh, the space. They're calling them settlers' moods and needs. Thus, Exxon, uh, Exum will make life on the moon more comfortable and stable is their goal. Now, Marty, some of these are going to be winners and some of them are going to be losers. There's going to be a Pillsbury out there. There's going to be a Ford Motor Company out there. But there's going to be a lot of Studebakers and, and other half-baked uh, people, ideas out there that aren't going to make it. So this is the, uh, we hope the democratic way that America was built on will continue in, uh, to the space on, entrepreneurs. Well, Lunar Outpost is one that you may have heard about. And this is theirs behind me here. It is a Colorado startup that wants to turn the space economy into the largest market in human history. Okay. Uh, think about that. I, I think we're on the cusp of something. And I really fear, you know, at my age as a baby boomer, I probably will be uh, I'm too old to see this come to fruition. But I guarantee in 100 years, there's going to be some moon economy that you won't believe. The company is developing rovers and other technologies. There's their outpost there. There's another one of their ideas. Uh, uh, putting systems and sensors on the surface of the moon, it intends to benefit both space exploration and the people of Earth. Uh, they're already working with NASA to carry out several missions on the moon. They're working on the Artemis missions. This is a logical habitat uh, that we've thought about for 50 years is put the soil of the moon called regolith over habitats to help insulate it from the harmful cosmic rays and solar radiation. And there on the top, you see some uh, skylights, if you will, uh, to uh, do some stargazing or whatnot. So, uh, and uh, so that's Lunar Outpost in uh, Colorado. And then We Space Technologies, okay? Think lunar hopper or lunar helicopter, though there's no air. At the, uh, this is another Israeli-based company. They are developing autonomous flying robotic systems, also known as thruster-propelled drones or hoppers. This technology is designed for lunar missions. It wants to partner with those that want to explore the moon. And according to the startup developers, uh, for the first time, uh, they want to go uh, underground on the world on on the moon. Okay, the lava tubes and permanently shadowed areas. They want to open them up uh, by flying these drones inside of them. How cool is that? And the lunar surface will open up many opportunities for future explorers. All right, uh, Bill Whiting. Thank you. I'm glad that you're watching today up in Michigan. Uh, Oh, and he says, Chad, consider changing the name of the show to Perseverance. And Bill, who's been in this studio before and knows a bit, little bit how uh, how it flows at the last minute. Thank you, Bill. We are keeping our perseverance here and our smiles on. As Marty and I, uh, we have gone through a lot of technical problems over the years, my friend. And I used to get pretty uptight about it because I wanted to always uh, exceed expectations. But uh, I've calmed down a lot from that attitude. And we're glad that we are meeting expectations by you watching us uh, up there, uh, Bill Whiting. Doug Forrest is enjoying an afternoon in L.A. Uh, uh, Dickie Cessna is watching. We've got Cynthia Rossi. Thank you, dear friend. Dave Stangy's up in Michigan. Daniel DeYoung laying over on his uh, big airplane, maybe. Thank you, Stangy, for watching up there. I got your messages. And uh, we'll be sharing some of that. John Allen's watching. Tom Usiak, thank you for the excellent photography, Tom. Steve Hammer and Danny Noah is watching. Seeing your name a lot, Danny. Thank you for staying curious. I want you to look up a couple of these companies we talked about. Uh, boy, they got some beautiful uh, uh, websites. And this We Space, I talked about. Imagine this little guy flying with these thrusters going through a lava tube 
there that's underneath the, where the lava tube collapsed where Apollo 15 landed. But we know there's a lot of lava tubes, and also Mars is filled with them. I think there's life in Mars caves. I'm convinced of it. Uh, there's got to be a warm habitat underneath the surface of Mars. Uh, and there's some blind crickets and, and uh, albino roly-polies under there. But this is a 3D printed facsimile of what uh, we Space Technologies wants to do. So to end Stay Curious here, Marty, what's going to get people to space? What's going to get people to space? A dollar bill, right? So when you think dollars, you're thinking space mining technologies if and or when they discover a chunk of an asteroid that's entirely made of gold or silver will they bring it back or not and completely destroy that uh, that precious metal on earth uh or will they uh, keep it out there and bring chunks of it back uh, and become uh, multi multi billionaires uh, these things are out there to be mined. There's also a, uh, the, we're going to, uh, we are going to, I think uh, NASA and ESA have a spacecraft going to an all iron or metal asteroid to see what that looks like. And there are asteroids uh, from a half a mile to five or 10 miles that are basically metal. And we're not sure exactly what's up with that. So space mining technologies space uh, was founded in the united kingdom in 2017 there's their concept it covers a wide range of technologies from extracting water uh, from the surface of other planets to space systems engineering in particular they're looking for working on a platform for autonomous rover navigation and ai services for designing complex rovers that they're going to call Armstrong. So, uh, But there's one of their concepts of mining an asteroid. And uh, one of the other concepts along with this that, uh, they're, that they are a company pioneering is to save the planet from a asteroid that we know is going to hit the Earth and could wipe out city or even humanity like it did the dinosaurs. So... Marty, almost $15 billion in space infrastructure companies going on around the world right now. And uh, everybody wants a, a piece of the pie. And we hope that they uh, invest their money wisely. We hope that their missions continue for success. It takes millions and millions of dollars to do it. Chalad Zan knows that. So is Christopher Mick. Uh, uh, hope, Christopher, you're out there getting ready for some astronomy outreach on this uh new moon weekend so well I'm, so uh we wish everybody well in in the, the startup world out there and going to the moon uh if artemis doesn't go we know that there's private companies going to go so uh it's an exciting time 50 years after the apollo era it looks like people are on fire to go back to the moon again marty so well, thank you for an excellent job of navigating our woes today. I'll let you hit the three. There we go. We've had a fun week this week, as usual. Uh, it's always an adventure, but uh, hopefully we'll get our Streamlabs situation completely solved. Thank you for sticking with us. And uh, just a reminder, a week from Monday is uh, Memorial Day, and we will be closed on Memorial Day, and we hope that you honor our soldiers and military appropriately on that day. One of my favorite holidays and favorite times of the year is the month of May. So hope that you all get out and enjoy a wonderful weekend, whatever you do in your hometown where finally the veil of winter is lifted off and everyone can uh, feel like they're in Florida, like we do 24 seven, right, Marty? So uh, thanks everybody. Fingers crossed to get Peggy Whitson up there to space and NASA's most experienced astronaut, the commander of Axiom 2, taking three rookies up there uh for uh, axiom space company and uh we're gonna be just three blocks from here watching all the action sunday afternoon so can't wait to see you again to tell you all about it until then i'm mark marquette saying come plan to visit our museum soon so we can bridge the space between us <laughs>